Let's close our eyes for prayer. A great God in heaven, we thank you very much for this study tonight. We thank you because you are revealing Jesus to us more and more. I will pray, Lord, that the picture, the portrait of Jesus we see tonight will encourage and strengthen every heart in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that through the strength and the encouragement of the scripture and the revelation of the spirit of God, you'll make us go higher in our Christian life and Christian uh, behavior and Christian ministry in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that through us, you reveal Christ to all the people. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are back in our study of the scriptures, and tonight we come back to this important study in Revelation chapter 1. As you open Revelation chapter 1, you come to verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you were to stop here, you will understand that as we look at the whole book of Revelation, we're looking at the revelation of what Jesus Christ will do what Jesus Christ will possess, and what Jesus Christ will look like in his glorified form. And actually, that's what we're looking at tonight, the vision of the glorified Christ. The vision of the glorified Christ. Actually, as you look at the book of Revelation, the Lord is revealing who he is at the present moment, the exalted one. The risen one, the glorified one, the king of kings and the lord of lords and the judge of the whole earth and the lord of the universe. And then he tells us in, in chapters 2 and 3, he talks about the condition of the church, giving us a revelation of what the church of Jesus Christ looks like all over the world and in all the ages. And then in chapters 4 and 5, he gives us the glories of heaven. He shows us the very throne of God and the worship of the angels and the worship of the redeemed and the worship of all the hosts of heaven and earth. And then from chapter 6, he begins to reveal to us the tribulation that will be on the face of the earth when the people of God will be in heaven. And then in chapter 19 is revelation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then in chapter 20 is another revelation of how Christ will have the authority and the final power over the devil. And then he'll be bound and he'll be put in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Chapters 21 and 22 you have the revelation of the glories everlasting in heaven forever and ever. And everything is coming from Christ. That's why it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. As you look at what we have studied already, you'll find in verse 1, it mentions Jesus Christ. And then it comes to chapter verse 2, and it mentions the testimony of Jesus Christ. It begins to describe him for us from verse 5. It says, this Jesus is a faithful witness. This Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. And this Jesus is a prince of the kings of the earth. And then he says, he tells us what he has done. He begins to tell about his function, about his role, about what he has done for you and for me, and what he's doing for millions of other people too. He says, he is the one that has washed us from our sins. And then he has made us kings and priests unto God, unto the Father. And then he says to him, be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. And then he begins to introduce himself now because John was so surprised when he had a voice behind him. What kind of voice is this? He begins to tell us is the one to come again because surely he will come again. Certainly he will come again. Who is this one? In verse 11 is the Alpha and is the Omega. And is the first and is the last. And then the Lord began to command him as to what he ought to do. You know that if he talks so much about Jesus Christ, in these few verses, what are we going to see in the verses, in the chapters still to come? Actually, before the revelation of the great end-time events, Christ, the central character, in this book of the revelation, had to reveal himself to John. He gave his identity to John so that John will know his authority, will know his present glory, and will know his future majesty. His voice sounded like that of a trumpet. And actually, when you think about that, when God gave to his people from Mount Sinai, and he spoke to them concerning the commandments of the Lord, his declarations came forth with a sound of a trumpet. 
Well, the children of Israel, they knew that the year of Jubilee was also announced by, with, a prop, with a trumpet. And when the great day of resurrection will come, it will be announced with the voice of the trumpet of God. And so John was aroused and John was awakened to the solemnity of what was about uh, to come. What was about to see the great Christ, the glorified Christ, the glorious Christ. And then the voice of Christ coming like a thunder and coming like a trumpet. Then John turned around to see who was talking to him. Who was commanding him to write everything that he saw. And then he saw it was the son of man. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But when John saw him, it wasn't like the familiar person he had known. That he leaned his head upon. It wasn't the humiliated Christ. It wasn't the incarnate Christ. It wasn't the one that he saw walking the streets of Galilee. This was a very different thing. In fact, before I read the account to you, look at verse 17 of chapter 1. And see the response. And see the shock that came on John. He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That was the effect of the vision of the glorified Christ on him. And we're looking at that today. And I pray that you'll produce a similar effect in our hearts as it's produced in the heart in the life of John. Come to Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle, he said, and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the voice of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. I'm sure you can get a feel of it even as we read the words. But obviously, if you were to see directly, as John saw, it might have produced the same effect in you. Because we're told now in verse 17, and when I saw him, the glorified Christ, the risen Christ, and I saw him in his majesty and glory and power, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. That's the portrait of the picture of Jesus Christ that John saw. He has seen Jesus Christ. In the days of his flesh, but now he was seen, the very son of man, in his glorified form. He saw an awesome vision of the son of man, the son of God. The description of the son of man, the son of God that he saw, was so glorious beyond comparison. There wasn't anything to compare that vision with any other thing he had seen before. Christ revealed himself with symbols of his function. That is, the things he did. You'll see as we go into the study, and of his character, and of his majesty and authority. His dignity was made to shine forth with judicial authority and kingly presence and power. As we go into the study, we're going to divide the study into three parts. Number one, sacred and spiritual duties of the glorified Christ. The glorified Christ revealed to John on the Isle of Patmos. It was revealed so that John will know the sacred duties of Christ, the spiritual duties of Christ, even now that Christ is in heaven. Number two, sublime dignity of the glorified Christ. And the dignity of Christ, supremacy of Christ, the sublime dignity of the glorified Christ. And then number three, now symbolic description of the glorified Christ. The symbolic description of the glorified Christ. We come to number one. The sacred and spiritual duties of the glorified Christ. We look at verse, 11, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice of him that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about by the paths with a golden garden. You'll see here, everything is in pictures, because you'll see that the book of Revelation itself is symbolic. As you look at the book of Revelation, the numbers are symbolic, and the pictures are symbolic. The revelations are symbolic. What you see of Christ is symbolic. Many, many things will need interpretation of those symbols, but wonderful thing, the wonderful thing is the Word of God has given us the interpretation to clear up those symbols that you read in the book of Revelation. It tells us, for example, he said, I turned. He had to turn because he had been, he had been down there in the Isle of Patmos, and he was maybe just uh, going on and doing his own thing. And then he tells us in verse 10, I was in the spirit, in the spirit of worship, in the spirit of adoration. You remember the Lord, in the day of the Lord, in the Lord's day. That was the first day of the week. And then immediately was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He had behind him a great voice as of a trumpet. And it wasn't a quiet, silent voice at all. It was something that thundered in his ears. And then when he heard, like a trumpet says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And then you're going to see something now in verse 11. It says, write in a book, the things to see and send to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And then he was wondering, what kind of voice is this? Everything had been quiet until this voice like a thunder came. And then he said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And immediately I turned, guess the first thing I saw? I saw the seven golden candlesticks. You say, what are those things? The candlesticks. It comes to verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks. What are they? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So you will understand then Christ standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It simply means that he was standing in the midst of the churches. Because the candlesticks, according to verse 20, represent the churches. Why? Because the world is in darkness. And Christ is the light of the world. And he has given us his light. And he has told us, you are the light of the world. And when you come together in an assembly, in a congregation, you form the assembly of people of God. The assembly for the light of the world. You are shining, I'm shining, let your light so shine. Before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And when all these born again people come together into an assembly, a congregation, a church, that's a candlestick that will be showing for the light, the light of the commandment of God, the light of the word of God, the light of the requirement of God. And so the church is a candlestick. Now, do you understand? The candlestick doesn't have any light of its own. You have to bring light to it. And we don't have any light of our own as a candlestick. It's the light of Jesus. That the grace of God, the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, when it changes our lives and turns us around, we become the candlestick. And then we're able to bear the light for the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to verse 12 of chapter 1. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Golden, precious, priceless. Because gold is the most precious metal. Which means that in the sight of God, the candlestick that is the church, the people of God, the congregation of born again, redeemed people, they are the most priceless and precious people on the face of the earth. And there are seven. Why seven? Seven is the number for completeness. I've told you before, you've seen that before in the word of God. That is the whole church. And then it says now, when he saw in the midst, in verse 13, it says, in the midst thereof, of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man. Isn't that what Jesus Christ had promised when he said, where two or three are gathered in my name? Look at it, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. In faithfulness to his promise, he came to have fellowship with his own people. 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And as you see that these candlesticks, they represent the church. You now have the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, glorified Christ, standing in the midst of them. And this is the thing that the children of Israel enjoyed in days gone by. That the Lord told them that it will be in their midst in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, reading from verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. Where the people of God are gathered together, the redeemed of the Lord, the ransomed of the Lord. In their own case, they have been redeemed from the land of Egypt. And the pollutions of Egypt had been cleansed away from them. All those idolat idolatrous things of Egypt had been taken away from them. And because they were now the people of God, washed and covered in the blood of the Lamb. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. They had passed from judgment unto life. And they were not condemned anymore. Just like the church today. Just like the believers today. And God said, because you are the redeemed of the Lord, the Lord thy God, walketh in the midst of thy camp. To do what? That's a purpose. That's a function. Why God will be in the midst of his people. It says to deliver thee. And to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. That is see no unclean sin in thee. And turn away from thee. We can see then that Christ came in the midst of his people. By the way, that uh, promise in the Old Testament. That God will be in the midst of his people. That promise had been given to us now in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When that happens, and you come out of the multitude of the gangs of the unbelievers and the sinners, and your sins are forgiven, and you become a child of God, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are part of the church of the living God. What happens then? What's the position of the Lord in the midst of such people? The latter part of verse 16. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, what's the consequence of that? Read that old verse. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Or what for what? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them. I will dwell with them, I will walk in them with them. And so you will see then that the Lord, he comes in the midst of the people, of the people of God. In Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 12 again, and I turned. I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. I saw the whole church. I saw the complete church. I saw the blood washed, redeemed people. I saw the saved people in their congregations, and I saw the church from age to age. And then in the midst of that church, of the complete church, the seven golden candlesticks, I saw one like unto the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, in the midst of his own people. When I saw him, how did I see him? What kind of dress did he have? And what is that telling me? Look at that verse 13, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Well, because you have not been an Israelite yourself, and you might not have seen the pictures of the priests and the high priests of those days, you might not understand. But you see here, when Jesus appeared to John, he saw him closed like the high priest. Because with well, the children of Israel, there's a particular way in which the high priest dressed. Not only that, the garment also looked like that of a prophet. In the Old Testament of the children of Israel. And he said, I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a priest here. I'm seeing a prophet here. Not only that, when you saw the kings in those days. And you saw them dress. They dressed different from the rest of the people. And it was like a prince, like a king. And so immediately, uh, John could see the threefold ministry and function and duty of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glorified Christ. The priest, the prophet. And the prince, he said, I saw him. 
And when I saw him, I wasn't just looking at the clothes. The clothes tell, told me something. Told me that Jesus Christ, as he's in heaven now, is making intercession for us because he's a high priest. Not only that, he's ruling in our hearts because he's our king. Not only that, he's revealing his mind to us by the spirit because he is the prophet. And look at this in the Old Testament. What the priest was supposed to do. The high priest in particular. As you look at uh, Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, reading from verse 1. Leviticus 24, reading from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, holy beating for the light, to cause the lambs to burn continually. That is, the children of Israel, they had in their tabernacle, in their temple. They had the outer court. They had the holy place. And they had the holy of holies. And then there was a place where the lamb was to be born in. There must be no darkness there at all. And the children of Israel, they were to bring in oil, olive oil, pure oil, a special kind of oil. And they were to be pouring it there. It was the responsibility of the priest. And it was to cause the lamb to be born in continually without the veil of the testimony. Verse 3. In the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. You see that? The word continually in verse 2. The word continually in verse 3. That is, the light must never go out. The fire must never go out. The high priest must make sure that he was tending that uh, lamb and he was uh, taking care of that candlestick, that the uh, fire or the light will be burning continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lambs upon the pure candlestick. That's the word, candlestick before the Lord continually. That's the word again, the third time, continually. And that was, the, that was what Aaron was to do. And Aaron was doing that as the high priest. Do you know that Jesus Christ is a high priest now? And as our high priest is the one to keep on making the lamb to be born in. That he is making the light to be shining every time. The oil now for us is the Holy Spirit. And continually Jesus Christ the high priest is ministering to the church. And is ministering to every believer in the church. So that you'll have enough of the oil of the Holy Spirit. And your lamb will be born in continually. I pray that light will keep on burning. In Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 4. Looking at Jesus Christ and the ministry of Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4, And no man taketh dishonor unto himself, but he that, is, that was called of God, as was Aaron. And immediately he mentioned Aaron, the high priest. He says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he says also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So then, as Aaron was a high priest among the children of Israel in the wilderness, so Jesus Christ, in the midst of his own people now, is the high priest. And it is the Father that has appointed him to be the high priest. And please remember, we find Jesus Christ in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks represent the church. And we find Jesus Christ right in the middle of the church. And he's the high priest. So that like Aaron did, and he made the light to be burning continually, Jesus Christ, the great high priest, will make our light to be burning continually. After we become born again, we don't need to backslide. The light can keep on shining, and the fire can keep on burning, and the zeal can keep on increasing, and the holiness can be permanent, can be can be permanent there. And the power of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of the Holy Ghost can be permanent in our lives. And the grace of God can be increasing in our lives because Jesus Christ will never fail in his duty. He is always, always, always in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 24. We're still talking about Jesus Christ, the great high priest. But this man, because he continued forever, he continued ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. 
that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You understand now? While John found the Son of Man, the Son of God, the glorified Christ, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of the churches, it's interceding for the church. It's encouraging the church. It's helping the church. It's uplifting the church. That's his ministry. It tells us in verse 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. It's talking about Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest. Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. You see directly that Jesus Christ referred to you as the high priest of our profession. Who was faithful to him that appointed him. That means he'll be faithful to the office and the function and the role and the duty of the high priest. He will never fail. If we backslide, it's not his fault. It's because we're careless. It's because we're not taking to us the grace of God available and the unction available and the anointing available and the ministry of Jesus Christ, the high priest that's available because it says, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. In verse 3, for this man referring to Jesus Christ, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as his son, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And you see that, that we are related to the Lord Jesus Christ, in that we are born again, in that we are children of God now, in that because we are children of God, he has become our high priest. I told you that when John saw the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified Christ, he saw him, number one, as the priest. Number two, he saw him as the prophet. As a prophet in the sense that uh, the, the garment that he wore, it just reminded him that Jesus Christ was not just priest, he was also prophet. We're told in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11, the ministry of Jesus Christ, what Jesus will do, who Jesus will be, and what relationship he will also have with us. And you know, I've told you, it's not only priest and it's not only prophet, it's prince as well. In Isaiah chapter 11 verse 4, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And the breath of his leaves uh, shall he slay the wicked, the ra and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his rays. You will see uh, it's talking about the girdle, it's talking about uh, the garment, it's talking about righteousness, and it's talking about the rod coming out of his mouth, which is his word, his pronouncement. Everything is pictorial here. But it's showing us who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ will do. By the way, when it says that he saw Jesus Christ in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which means he was perpetually present in the midst of his own people. Isn't that what he said when he rose from the dead? And he gave the great commission to his own disciples. And in giving to his own disciples, he has given to us as well. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord is still with us today. I said the Lord is still with you today because his promises will never, never fail. We're told because of that promise that will never fail, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He'll always function as a priest, the high priest, and as a prophet, and then as a prince, as a king and the Lord over us. That's the reason we have nothing to fear on earth. In Hebrews chapter 13, 
reading from verse 5 and verse 6. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and verse 6. Let your conversation now be, uh, be without covetousness and be content, be satisfied with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You remember we studied that last week that the church was going through persecution. This was the time and the era, the empire of Domitian. And Domitian was a very cruel and wicked tyrant as an emperor. And he persecuted the church. And then it was a great encouragement to John, the beloved, as was languishing there in the prison, in the Isle of Patmos, in banishment. And all of a sudden, he had this great voice. And it was the voice that thundered like a trumpet. And he looked back and he saw Jesus Christ in the midst of the church, that Jesus Christ has not abandon the church. Yes, there's persecution. Oh yes, as the light is shining in the darkness of the world, the world does not fully understand and therefore they persecute the people of God but what an encouragement, what an upliftment as John saw the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of the church. When he saw the church in the midst of the, when he saw Christ in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, still showing light. That Jesus Christ was still faithful to his promise and was in fellowship with his people. From the messages we see, we know that when Jesus Christ comes in the midst of the church, he is there to observe and to examine the church. Do you know that he examines our church? He observes our church? Do you know that Jesus Christ is in the midst of the church and he sees every member? He observes every member. He examines every member. Not only that, he is there to support and to encourage the church. And while you are there, whatever you are going through, maybe you are going through some troublous times at home, and things are tough at home, please understand, the Lord will never leave you. The Lord will never forsake you because he's in the midst of the church. He's there for your encouragement. He's there for your support, and he strengthens the church. He protects the church. He will protect you, and he will strengthen you. Of course, as we look at um, uh, chapters 2 and 3, he corrects the church and he warns the church and he promises to reward the faithful overcomers in the church. Christ is seen in his exalted position, in his exalted power as the Lord of the church and the King of the universe. As we look at this uh, vision, you see him, the garment and the girdle. I told you already, that shows him his priest. It shows him as prophet. It shows him as king and prince. Wearing the robe worn by the high priest in the Old Testament, the glorified Lord in the midst of his own church was interceding for the church, empowering the church, and revealing the mind of God to his people. As priest, he restores our souls. He renews us. He rekindles our lamps and our light. As prophet, he reveals the whole mind of God unto us. As king and prince, he rules and he reigns in our heart and he reigns in his church. As a high priest, he was to keep the, was to keep the light of the candlestick perpetually shining. So Christ's duty is to grant us constant supply of the oil of the Holy Spirit so that he will keep our light shining. He is a faithful high priest. If we ask him for needed grace, he will not fail us. He will not deny us. The Lord will not fail you at the time of your need. We come to point number two. Sublime dignity of the glorified Christ. The sublime dignity of the glorified Christ. I come to chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In verse 13, it says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with a pass with a golden girdle, his head and his ears were white like wool. And white as snow, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. As you look at that description, if you're a student of the Old Testament, in particular Daniel, you will know that that's exactly the description we had come across in the book of Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and this will reveal something to you of the glory of Christ, of the majesty of Christ, of the wisdom of Christ, of the power of Christ, and of all the majesty and the glory being revealed to John on the Isle of Patmos concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 9. 
Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and here the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. You will see here that the description we have read in, the, in Revelation chapter 1 is very much parallel to this one. But this is talking about the ancient of days. This is talking about the almighty God himself. And we're told about his hair being white, as white as snow, as pure wool. And then we're told of the flame of fire that is burning and coming out of his throne. Then look at verse 13. I saw in the night visions, behold one like the son of man. Here we come now. Christ Jesus himself, a pre-incarnate. It says, uh, at the pre before he came to this world, before his humanity, the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and brought and they brought him, Christ, near before him, before the ancient of days. And it says, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him is dominion is an everlasting dominion praise the lord which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed we're told that the son of man that's the Lord Jesus Christ was brought before the ancient of days. But the point is, you can see how the ancient of days, God Almighty himself, how he was described. And as uh, he's describing the majesty of the ancient of days, of the Almighty of God himself, is describing the purity of his wisdom and the purity and the completeness of his knowledge. And Daniel doesn't stop there because much revelation was given to Daniel. We're looking at chapter 10 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all. So three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hidekel, then I lifted up mine eyes, and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of offer. His body was like the burial, and his face was the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to burnish uh, polish the brass, and the voice of his was like the voice of a multitude. You will see that what John saw on the Isle of Patmos, even uh, Daniel had seen something like that before. We're looking at the dignity of Christ, the majesty of Christ, the, uh, the honor of Christ shining forth as we behold him glorified in this vision is the exalted one. He has been exalted by the almighty God himself, by the ancient of days. His description is parallel to that of the ancient of days himself in honor in glory in dominion we know that he is one with god the father i and my father are one what do you understand by that snowy white hair that symbolizes the purity of his truth and the perfection of his wisdom have you seen sometimes when you see the pictures in the papers, if you've not been to the law courts yourself, you'll see those lawyers and you'll see the judge wearing that a wig on the head and it's all white. And it, that whiteness is showing the purity of wisdom and the purity of principle as the judge, as he comes, they know he's going to be fair. They know he's going to be just. He's going to judge everything right because what he's putting on the head, that white wig, is a symbol of fairness and faithfulness and loyalty to the law and as a judge that has wisdom that is competent as you see the lord jesus christ and he comes he comes as a king he comes as the judge of the whole earth and then you see that he has the purity of truth and he has the perfection of wisdom he is absolutely pure and perfect in his ministry to the church he is purging and purifying the church with his own blood so that he'll make us blameless and holy and as you come to Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, you don't only see the white hair, uh, you also see the eyes and the flames of fire, penetrating fire. 
piercing fire, piercing eyes. That is in verse, uh, in verse 14, the latter part of verse 14, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes like a flame of fire. And this is talking about his knowledge. This is talking about uh, the, the searching and the piercing, penetrating eyes that will see into the depths of the church with holy intelligence. That is, when he looks at the church, the intelligence he has, the wisdom he has, is not just ordinary human intelligence or wisdom. It's holy, divine wisdom and intelligence. He sees everything in the heart of everyone in the church. He sees perfectly. And there are no secrets, there are, nothing, there, are, there are no secrets that can be hidden from him. Nothing misses his piercing, penetrating eyes. No deeds, no thoughts can be hidden from him. When he judges, he judges righteously. When he condemns and when he comments, he does that accurately. He is a divinely appointed judge before whom the whole world will stand on the final day. Uh, look at the comment of the scriptures concerning uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and concerning the God of heaven. When we think about God, we're also thinking about Jesus Christ because their attributes are similar. Their characteristics are similar. It tells us in Psalm 93. Psalm 93, I'm reading to you from verses 2 and 3. Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. Then he tells us, in, but, uh, let me go back to verse 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he has guarded himself. The world also is established and it cannot be moved. Then it says, thy throne, the thro throne of the Lord, is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. And that's talking about God. That's also talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Are uh, you getting something here? Because we're talking about the clothes of the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen, glorified, majestic Christ. And it says that cloth is a cloth of honor, is a cloth of majesty. Who covereth, but still covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And then as we look at the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which I've told you already that uh, the pure a wool white hair is a showing you're seeing on adulterated wisdom, unstained wisdom, divine wisdom, perfect wisdom, pure wisdom. In Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, in whom are hid all treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that's the pure air and that is white as white as wool in romans chapter 11 romans chapter 11 from verse 33 romans 11 verse 33 oh the depths of the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. And then in verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. As you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, it there's even an allusion to this in the Old Testament. Uh, please open your Bible to the Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. And see the allusion that is made to the wisdom of Christ from the very foundation of the earth. From the time God created the world, Christ had been with him because Christ is everlasting. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He has been here before the creation of the world and he will be here after the world has folded up and is burnt up and is, is forgotten. In Proverbs chapter 8 verse 23, I was set off from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the world, the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Then he says, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. 
when he set a compass upon the face of the death, when he established the clouds above, when he stretched the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass, his commandment, when he appointed the fountains of the earth, then was I by him as one brought up with him, and I was delays, delight, rejoicing always before him. And you will see then that Jesus Christ had always been there. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. That was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We'll come back to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, reading verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. We well, see looking at this characteristic of Jesus Christ, the fire coming out of his eyes. It says, and unto the angel of the church in Tatar write, these things says, the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. That is Jesus Christ, it says. He has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. It's like uh, the, the laser uh, that comes out today and penetrates every nook and corner when the doctors are performing their operation. In Revelation chapter 19, see looking at these characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ as it's shown to us in pictorial form. The Lord Jesus Christ, exalted and risen and honored and majestic, and glorified. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading to you from verse 11. And I saw the heavens opened. And behold, the white horse, and one that sat upon him was called faithful. This is Christ. And true, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in righteousness was he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. You cannot miss it. You read it in chapter 1. You read it in chapter 2. Now in chapter 19, the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ like a flame of fire. By the way, these were the eyes that wept when he was still on the earth. When he was in the days of his humiliation, these were the tender eyes and people could look into those eyes and see the compassion and see the mercy and see the love. But now he comes as a judge. He comes as a prince. He comes as the one that is equal to the ancient of days. He comes in glory, in honor, in majesty. And when you look at the eyes now, you don't see tears coming out. You don't see the tenderness and the compassion you saw in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But now you see a flame of fire. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Watch of God, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We come to Hebrews chapter 4, because we are also told that uh, the you know, this Jesus Christ, the knowledge he has, that there is nothing that can escape his knowledge because he is the one we're dealing with now. He's a glorified Christ sitting on the throne as the Lord of the church, is the head of the church. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Uh, that's the description of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can see everything. He knows everything. He has perfect knowledge because he's not glorified. He doesn't need to ask us any question now. What are you Pharisees discussing with my disciples? No, he knows everything now because of his piercing eyes like flame of fire. Here is the way that we read it in the Psalms in Psalm 11 verse 4. Psalm 11 verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Uh, today now as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very different. As we see the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very different now. Here John that was uh, leaning upon the bosom of Jesus Christ, uh, when he was in the days of his flesh, as he saw the Lord Jesus Christ at this time, it was something else. It was 
different. Here was fire, here was fire coming out of his very eyes. Uh, you, you understand that then Jesus Christ, when he saw him, it fear seized him. And then he fell at the feet of Jesus Christ as if he was dead until Jesus laid his right hand on him and said, Rise up, be not afraid. I'm the first and the last. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. We're going to point number three now. The symbolic description of the glorified Christ. Symbolic description of the glorified Christ. I come to Revelation chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 13. Revelation chapter 1 verse, let's go back to verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his eyes and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Already I've told you, and you can see it yourself, that the book of Revelation is full of symbols. And as we look at these symbols, you mustn't allow your imagination or fantasy to run loose and begin to interpret it the way you want. Actually, as we look at it, the book explains itself. The revelation explains itself. And as you look at those symbolic descriptions, you can see the interpretation in the Word of God. That's why you will carefully look at the Word of God as it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, for example, Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. And you're looking at the description of the Lord Jesus Christ in these symbolic pictures or portrait that is given unto us. In Isaiah chapter 63, reading from verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? That which this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Here Isaiah saw in a vision also, and he said, who is this one coming? His garments is like it's been dyed. It's like uh, it's dyed in red color, which is uh, signifying the blood of the Lamb. And he says, it's traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then he replied, it's I that speak that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou rich in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine press? Now when you tread the wine press, you are treading with the feet. And you will see in the passage you have, you have read in Revelation, it's talking about the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, like Polish, uh, Polish brass, which means it will tread down the rebellion, the rebellious people in judgment that treadeth the wine fat. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my own. Which is he's talking about Jesus Christ as a judge, Jesus Christ that will crush and tread upon the sinners, because it says his feet is as brass, very, very strong and very militant. And and all the enemies, he will put all the enemies under his feet. And then he says, I will trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance in my in mine heart is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed is come. As you look at the Lord Jesus Christ then, and you see what Jesus Christ looks like, and he describes his feet. He's describing him as he will come as a judge, and then he will judge the world in righteousness. Come back to this, Revelation chapter 19, which we read before. We're looking at it from verse 13 now. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Isn't that similar to what we have read in Isaiah now? And then it says his name is called the Word of God. And it says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that 
that with it he might it might it shall rule he might smite the nations that's judgment he will judge the nations he will smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron listen to this and he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty god so then when you read about his feet in revelation chapter one you're reading about the judgment that will come that all enemies all rebellion all the disobedient all the people that refuse and reject jesus christ they will be trodden under the foot of the judgment of god in first corinthians chapter 15 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 24 and 25. 24, 25. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. That's what he's telling us. That Jesus Christ, when he comes, he comes as king. He comes as judge. And he comes as the one that will trample upon all those who have rejected the mercy of God, who have rejected the love of God, who have not given their lives unto the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes as a judge. That's the description of what John was seeing. And John understood that because John was an apostle. And he had the spirit of God and he understood the Old Testament and all these pictures you find in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, reading verses 30 and 31. Therefore, prophesy thou against all these, against them, all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from his from on high, and his voice from the holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation, and he shall, he shall give a shout. As they that tread the graves against all the inhabitants of the earth, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. We're reading Psalm 29. Psalm 29, reading from verse, uh, reading from verse. 3, Psalm 29. I'm reading there from verse 3. I don't, want you, I don't want you to lose the trend of what we are studying here now. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen his clothing. We've seen his head and his ears, white as wool. And we've seen the fire coming out of his eyes. We've seen his feet, that these feet like, were like fine brass, as if it burnt in the furnace. The next thing we're looking at is his voice. It says in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 1, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And we read in Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord, verse 3, is upon the waters. The God of the glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and, and Syrian uh, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh, the voice of the Lord maketh the hind to calve and discovereth the forest. And in his temple does everyone speak of his glory. The Lord seateth upon the flood, yea, the Lord seateth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You will see then the mighty voice of Jesus Christ. When he comes, he will not be whispering. When he comes, he will not be talking gently because he will be coming as as a mighty judge with all power and with all might. And the Psalms in Psalm 73 we have, we have shown more of the revelation of the majesty and the glory of the Lord in Psalm 73. Reading from verse 23. Psalm 73 verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou art holding me with the right hand. Have you seen what he's telling us in the book of Revelation? Because he's talking about Jesus Christ in his right hand. 
he has seven stars. And those seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. That is the minister, that is the leaders of the church. And if he's holding the leaders and the ministers in the church, he's holding the members of the church too. And here he says, the psalmist is telling us, thou hast holding me with thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. It says, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then he tells us, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a warring, going astray from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all his works. Please come back to Revelation chapter 1. As we look at Revelation chapter 1, and we're looking at the symbolic representation, the symbolic description of the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us now in verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Can you imagine that Jesus Christ now, the pronouncement coming out of his mouth, the proclamation, the word coming out of his mouth is the word of judgment because it says, out of the mouth of this one that I saw, the son of man in his glory and honor, majesty and dominion, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. John, what does that mean? Let Jesus himself tell us in Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12 as well as verse 16. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These things says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. What does that mean? Jesus continues in verse 16. He says, Repent. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Which means then that sword that is coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ is to cut and condemn and, and is to destroy all those unbelievers, the people that refuse to repent. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 15. Revelation chapter 19 verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And that with it, he should smite the nations. That with it, that sharp sword, he should smite the nations. And then we're told in verse 20, see him in action here. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought the miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had, de that had received the mark of the beast. And them that worship his image, these both were cast alive. Unto the lake of unto the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Listen to this, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Of the which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You see, then it is the judgment, the judgment that came upon them. We want to now look at the final description of the Lord Jesus Christ as we come to Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It says, His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Obviously, at this time now, John will remember what had happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because there was a time when the curtain was drawn apart a little. And he could see the coming glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself had told them, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That is, they will see the picture of the glory of the Lord when he comes in his kingdom. And then we're told in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and he bringeth them up onto a high mountain. It was there now, he was transfigured in verse 2, before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And as John saw Jesus Christ, glorified Christ, on the Isle of Patmos, he must then remember the glory of the Lord. And it is exactly what Paul the Apostle had seen as Paul was describing his experience on the road to Damascus. He said, I saw that face too, because nothing shone. And I said, Lord, who are you? What must I do? And Jesus identified himself. I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Look at the story in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 verse 
13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way light from heaven. And that light was above the brightness of the sun. This was at as midday, when the sun was shining in its brightness. And yet this light I saw was above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me. And them which journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, when that light came, just like it happened to John, on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory and majesty and honor, he fell down as if he was was dead. The same thing happened to Paul the apostle when he saw that when he saw that light. He had not even seen the fullness of the glory of Christ. He said, "All of us were fell to the earth, and I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks." And I said, "Who art thou, Lord?" And he said, "I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest." You'll see then that it is Jesus Christ. How does the end of Revelation describe this Jesus? Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, we're looking at verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things. In the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. I pray that your light is light in your heart in Jesus' name. You have seen the vision of the glorified Christ as he revealed himself through the symbolic uh, description. Now you understand. You take note of him. Number one, the son of man in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Number two, is a son in priestly Princely, uh, priestly prophets close. Number three was snowy head and air. The symbols of supreme and divine wisdom. You see number four, the searching eyes, piercing and penetrating and probing. Every conscience with, with number five, smashing feet to judge the condemned. Number six, the sound of his voice. That is, uh, that is of the mighty conqueror. Number seven, the seven stars. They are under his uh, control, his sovereign control. Number eight, your Find a sharp sword out of his mouth that cuts and condemns the impenitent. And then we have number nine, the shining sun of his countenance that radiates glory and eternal brightness. The picture of Jesus Christ we see here is very instructive. You've seen the significance of the snowy air that he is the pure wisdom. And the, the eyes as flame of fire that he knows everything. There's nothing you can hide from him. How about his feet like white, hot, glowing brass that symbolizes uh, judgment on sin. He cannot and he will not condone sin in his church. And he shall, as he will crush the unrighteous under his feet, his thundering voice shows his majesty and his power and his authority and he speaks authoritatively in his church and speaks authoritatively to his church and then he's still wielding the, the sharp sword to defend his church to protect his church and defeating those who attack his people that sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth is a symbol of the word of christ the proclamation of christ that will cut and condemn with a sharp blade of judgment on sinners on the final day and then we read that the lord shines in his church and he shines through his church and he reflects his glory through the church and then you find that all who love him must now today reflect and reveal the glory of the lord as you look at this chapter one and you look at this description of the lord jesus christ look at it before we pray as i turned in verse 12 to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with white, with a garment down to the foot. And then he skirt about with paths of with a golden girdle. He said, and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace of fire, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went his sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Do you see here the portrait of Christ? 
And then number one, we see the position of Christ. Where is Christ today? Where is the position of Christ today? In the very midst of the church. And it's very close to you there. Are you sorrowful? Do you have a problem? Jesus Christ, the position of Christ is in the midst of the church. He comforts, he strengthens, he empowers, and he energizes. Then we see number two, the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see there in his clothes. The priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for you. He's caring for you. And he will take all, if you take all your needs unto the Lord, it will supply all your need. Number three, we see the purity of Christ. Absolute holiness. The pure white air that is pure as wool. And then we see the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the perception of the Lord Jesus Christ? He perceives everything. He knows everything. And there is nothing you can hide away from him. And then we see his feet that he crushes the sinner. The power of Christ. And then the protection of Christ. Because he's holding the people is his own right hand. He's holding your hand. He will not allow you to fall. And he will perfect what, we are what he has started in your life. In Jesus name. And then the sword that is coming out of his mouth is the pronouncement of Christ as the final judge of heaven and earth. He has been appointed as the judge, the position of Christ, the priesthood of Christ, the purity of Christ, the perfection of Christ, the perception of Christ, the power of Christ, the protection of Christ, and the, and the pronouncement of the Lord. You are a child of God. There's something to rejoice about. Our Lord, our Christ, our Savior is the one that is going to rule the whole universe forever and ever, and you, by the grace of God, you will reign with the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's thank the Lord for what the Lord has done. Let's thank the Lord for his revelation. Let's thank the Lord for what he has revealed to us today. Of the glory of Christ, of the honor of Christ, of the majesty of Christ, of the dominion of Christ. He reigns and he rules forever. Let him reign and let him rule in your heart.